Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Applied Remote Sensing Training introductory webinar on remote sensing for disaster management. My name is Tim Stow, and I will be one of your instructors today. Our other instructor will be guest speaker Maggie Glasgow, and she will be presenting on the use of NASA data for earthquake and tsunami response, while I will be presenting on the use of NASA data for volcano um, response. Maggie has worked for many years developing, developing applications for earth science and disaster response and um, is very kind to be uh, lending her time to our class. So the prerequisite, um, as I mentioned, for which there was a homework, is the fundamentals of remote uh, sensing, session number one, just the first session of that, uh, that course. Um, you can see the um, web address here. Uh, and. Um, You've probably already completed this material. Uh, if you haven't, uh, please do so as soon as possible. It is required for the course certificate, which I will mention later. So um, all of the course material for this webinar will be um, at this web page, as indicated in the presentation. You can uh, find it at the RSET uh, website. There will be links available to um, these presentations and any additional material um, that might be presented on. Um, um, the objectives of this particular course uh, will be to have uh, the particip you participants become aware of what's available in NASA Remote Sensing Resources for Disaster Management and uh, to point you to um, the websites for accessing that data. Um, in some cases, the, um, the uh, methods that we'll be discussing are ones that are, that are in, in research and aren't available for every disaster. Um, but but there are many resources which are available all the time. So as I said, our course will consist of um, four sessions uh, over four weeks. Uh, well, two sessions a day over four weeks. Uh, week one is monitoring of um, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes using re mass NASA remote sensing uh, data and models. Week two will be an overview of remote sensing for wildfire. Week three will be um, the observation of oil spills using uh, remote sensing measurements. And uh, week four will be the monitoring of storms, uh, flooding, and landslides using remote sensing observations. So our agenda for this week. Um, I will be presenting um, on monitoring volcanoes and volcanic ash. Um, we'll discuss pre-eruption monitoring, um, a SAR views system, which is a, a utilizes a simulated, a simulated aperture radar for uh, monitoring volcanoes, um, the threats and methods for monitoring volcanic ash, and then I'll have a, um, a, a summary of remote sensing uh, resources. Uh, Maggie will present on uh, monitoring earthquakes and tsunamis in part two. So part one, monitoring volcanoes and volcanic ash. <clears throat> Pre-eruption monitoring of volcanoes uh, with remote sensing data is uh, concentrated mostly on um, volcanoes which are remote and lack significant um, on-the-ground monitoring tools, um, and the deformation monitoring of those um, from remote sensing is uh, done with uh, synthetic aperture radar and, in some cases, um, other remote sensing technologies that allow um, the computation of, uh, of um, topographic maps. Uh, global uh, na navigation satellite stations like uh, uh, GPS and GLONASS are also used on the ground. Um, to measure the deformation, and um, when you can install um, when you can install tools uh, in situ, tilt meters are also used. Um, another key um, another key indicator of volcanic activity is seismic activity prior to events, and um, we'll discuss a little bit of how these come together in uh, in determining hazard from a volcano in advance of an eruption. So, um, in August of 2015, there was a significant unrest of the Cotopaxi um, volcano. And um, this volcano was monitored uh, with SAR, in this case. Um, presented here as a, an overview of the um, deformation of the ground 
and then a few uh, transits across the uh, across the, uh, the mountain. Um, as you can see here, um, there is uh, some inflation being shown across this transit. Um, and here, this is uh, deflation in a given point over time. This is uh, one point in time across a, a line, and this is um, one point in space over time. And you can see that leading up to the um, steam eruption, you can see uh, inflation occurring in a, uh, in a point on the mountain's flank. And uh, so observations like these can give us some indication of, of um, activity and a little bit of lead time uh, before that activity occurs potentially. So uh, this is another um, case in which um, in which uh, SAR was used to monitor um, a volcano. This is the um, uh, Akmak um, eruption in July of 2008. Um, Akmak is located on one of these Aleutian Islands down here. So uh, here is when the eruption actually took place on July 12th of 2008, um, and it had a long eruptive period. Uh, oops. Oh, wait. My apologies. There we go. Um, the first thermal signal in remote sensing only appeared 20 minutes after the eruption began, um, which is important to know that the eruption is ongoing but gave no forewarning. Um, There we go. However, um, just before the eruption, only 20 minutes before, um, seismic signals were measured that indicated the um, oncoming eruption. However, in analysis of the SAR data, um, 25 days prior to the eruption, um, some deformation was seen on the flanks of the mountain. Um, this is a this is a case study using historic data. However, um, the SARVIEW system at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks um, is being developed to follow just these sorts of signals in advance of eruptions. And um, for uh, certain locations and uh, um, and and certain conditions, SAR data is freely available. Um, and in the future, uh, NASA will be launching the uh, NISAR mission, which will provide a global uh, freely available SAR data. So in addition to pre-event monitoring, um, there's the hazard of uh, volcanic ash for aviation. Um, so air traffic is occasionally faced with this threat. Um, we may all remember the um, aviation crisis caused in 2010 by the eruption of the Ayafiatla Yokot volcano. Um, so ash is most threatening immediately after the eruption. However, for a very long time afterwards, the, the ash can, um, can hang in the atmosphere and cause problems for aircraft. As of yet, there have been no crashes caused from ash encounters. However, there has been significant damage to uh, caused to aircraft and, um, and very near or close calls. Um, so detecting volcanic ash with remote sensing, people would often think of, of images like this iconic image from the Ayafiatli uh, eruption in April of 2010. Um, and these images quite often are our best source of information about where the ash is in the atmosphere. This is the sort of visible image that you get from an from, um, a imaging satellite. However, there are many um, other uh, technologies of remote sensing which can provide more information about the ash. For instance, um, the uh, multispectral imaging can give us significant information about the ash clouds and how they um, uh, develop over time. Uh, this is a number of different spacecraft and organizations which, uh, which, which monitor those and their position in orbit. So these are uh, low Earth orbit spacecraft, and uh, the bottom ones down here are geosynchronous uh, spacecraft. Um, these, this particular processing uh, comes from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and NOAA's uh, CMIS multispectral processing software, and it generates a variety of products, including ash detection, ash cloud top height, <coughs> ash effective radius, and ash mass loading. Um, 
and using all of these sensors uh, allows the full capability of each sensor to be exploited and um, a fairly clear picture of where the ash hazard um, is located. Um, the NOAA NESDIS uh, volcanic alert system uh, also pulls together uh, data from Aura and OMI on, uh, on silicon, or sorry, on sulfur dioxide gas in the atmosphere. Um, while sulfur dioxide gas is not a particular threat, it is indicative of the location of the ash threat, so tracking it is important as well. Um, this uh, page has been hosted, or this uh, data is hosted on the Washington um, uh, VAC site, which we'll link to later. Um, since 2010, and this data is operationally available to uh, aviation um, uh, to aviation warning uh, systems around the world. The same and additional data is also available through the um, European Support for Aviation Control Service. Uh, it, it brings together many different sensors in a convenient web interface where you can find information on silicon dioxide, silicon dioxide as, or sorry, sulfur dioxide, as well as ash and uh, cloud information. So in addition to these um, uh, multispectral remote sensors, uh, there's also um, the uh, Calypso LiDAR, which uh, is an instrument which retrieves a slice through the atmosphere and shows a profile of the atmosphere. Um, it's been operating since 2006, and it uh, has uh, an equatorial crossing time of 1.30 uh, in the morning and uh, 1.30 in the afternoon each day, and repeats the same uh, path every 16 days. Uh, it has a high vertical resolution, uh, which is it can resolve the heights of things off the ground to within uh, 60 meters. Um, and the parameters of the spacecraft provide an ability to detect volcanic ash and its vertical structure. So this LIDAR information, which we can see here in slices across um, the area of Australia and New Zealand, um, in these, these slices here, um, this information can be collected uh, and by way of a uh, atmospheric model uh, can be used to provide uh, forecasts of up to uh, 72 hours of ash movement, uh, forecasts up to 72 hours in the future. So. Um, in addition to the LIDAR, there's also um, the MISER, or multi-angle imaging radi spectral radiometer um, instrument. MISER is a very unique um, instrument, and there's no other like it presently in space. It uh, images nine, uh, collects nine different images simultaneously at different angles from the spacecraft, as you can see here. Um, some will look forward along the path that the spacecraft is looking and some, or is moving, and some look backwards. This allows it to um, resolve stereo information about clouds and about features on the ground. So in this uh, example shown here, uh, there is a plume from the volcano. There are, in fact, two distinct plumes, and you can see one um, in the red and green up this way, and a smaller one in the blue here. Um, because MISER data is very unique, uh, it's somewhat difficult to process. However, um, it is the, its data is available and, um, and can be processed uh, with some research and effort. Um, Oh, there is the one issue with the MISER data is that um, its spatial resolution, which is on the order of a kilometer, um, has uh, limited its utility, but for large eruptions, um, that may be less of a factor. So here's a list of rem uh, remote sensing resources uh, for monitoring volcanic ash. Um, and um, these are in here for you to review offline. And um, this concludes the volcano and volcanic ash portion of the uh, session.
Okay. Thanks, Tim. So uh, I will uh, be speaking about monitoring earthquakes and tsunamis using the NASA remote sensing um, technology and models. Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, give you a brief outline of the, the talk. Um, I'll give you an introduction to um, the methods that we can use to monitor earthquakes and tsunamis. And uh, uh, talk about how we respond to earthquakes uh, and tsunamis, um, and then talk about the remote sensing techniques to monitor earthquakes, uh, giving some examples of two earthquakes that we've responded to um, in the, the past couple of years, uh, the 2014 Napa earthquake in California and the 2015 uh, Gorkha Nepal earthquake. And then I'll talk about some techniques that we've used to monitor uh, and respond to tsunamis. Um, and I'll use the 2011 Northeast Japan earthquake in, as an example. And then um, I'll go over some conclusions. So as an introduction, um, talking about some earthquake and tsunami risk, uh, the an annualized losses from earthquakes just in the United States are $5.3 billion. And from 2000, from the year 2000 to 2009, earthquakes killed more people globally than any other natural disaster. Uh, from 1980 to 2009, six of the seven natural disasters with the largest economic impact were earthquakes. Um, and in the 21st century, earthquakes are expected to kill 1.9 to 3.2 million people globally. And this figure here on the right, um, the green arrow. Here. is uh, a uh, figure that is showing the damaging earthquakes that are concentrated near coastal areas um, over the two uh, past two decades. Um, and they're uh, displayed over East Asia and the Pacific, and they're colored by depth. Um, and this data is from the Advanced National Seismic System. OK, so earthquake and tsunami risk um, is quite great. So in 2004, the Indian Ocean tsunami um, reached heights of 65 to 100 feet in Sumatra, caused over 200,000 deaths across 11 countries, um, and registered on tide gauges globally. Uh, the 1964 Alaska tsunami resulted in 110 deaths. Um, in 1918, um, the earthquake and tsunami uh, killed 118 people in Puerto Rico alone, um, and uh, the uh, Pacific tsunami in the year 1700 overran Native American fishing camps and caused damage in Japan. Um, and here on uh, the right, we have um, the threat uh, of tsunami sources um, across the, um, uh, the world. And you'll see that um, there are uh, these uh, tsunami threats um, along the coast from well-known uh, typical sub subduction zones. And there are other threats from um, other um, areas that, um, and these are uh, usually from subduction zones, um, but they can be caused by um, other earthquakes as well. So the mechanisms for, for earthquakes and tsunamis um, are, are, are from faults uh, both on land and uh, tsunamis typically from underwater earthquakes. Um, we have faults on land that are made up of uh, central, core, uh, central core that are um, surrounded by damage zones. Um, and earthquakes occur when stress builds up on these faults, um, and then it fails. Um, ground shaking and displacement lead to injury and loss of life, and they cause damage uh, to infrastructure, homes, um, and injury and loss. Uh, and tsunamis occur when the seafloor is displaced by an underwater earthquake or landslide, and they generate waves that grow when they reach the shore, and they can grow to um, very great heights. And they can um, run up um, very um, far um, uh, inland. So how do we respond to earthquakes and tsunamis? Um, when an earthquake or tsunami um, occurs, uh, researchers uh, start to gather information from various sources, including uh, satellites. And uh, one of the ways that we are able to gather this information is um, that the International Charter um, may be invoked in order to target uh, spaceborne assets for disaster response. And here on the, the right, we have scenes from um, the um, 
Sumatra uh, tsunami in Indonesia. And you can see here that it was quite devastating. You, you have um, people that um, were dealing with uh, inundation very far inland. And you can see the devastation from the tsunami. Uh, so what is the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters? Well, this provides a unified system of space data acquisition and delivery to um, the, the areas affected by um, disasters. And this can be both um, uh, a man-made or natural disaster. And it um, is, is designed to mitigate the effects of disasters on human life and property through uh, member agency resources. So this can be if, um, invoked by um, any nation that's affected by a disaster. And this is, is um, specifically used to task satellite um, assets so that it can collect information in the wake of disaster so that um, it can be used to respond to the disaster. So I'm going to talk about some remote sensing observations that we've used to monitor earthquakes um, in the case of a couple of earthquakes. Um, so we use synthetic aperture radar um, in order to collect data. Um, we have here um, two examples of some NASA um, uh, assets. Uh, one is a planned mission that will launch in 2020. It's called NISAR. It's the NASA ISRO SAR mission. And uh, down here on the bottom um, is UAV SAR, which is the Uninhabited Aerial Vehicle Synthetic Aperture Radar. Um, this is an airborne uh, asset that um, can fly. It has very high resolution and can be um, used very quickly after an, uh, an, a disaster. Um, radar is very useful for studying Earth processes. And the re repeat visit allows uh, creation of landscape change images um, with very high definition. Um, for UAV SAR, we have a 7 meter pixel size um, that gives us very high resolution look at the change in um, the, the Earth's uh, uh, ground surface um, and 10 meter pixel size for the satellite. And this is very sensitive and can see up to uh, one centimeter or less surface change in, um, in fault slip. Um, so uh, for UAV SAR, uh, we use this for uh, the 2014 Napa earthquake response. This was a magnitude 6 earthquake that occurred on the 25th of August in 2014. And this was the strongest earthquake to occur in the Bay Area since 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And the NASA data aided in response and analysis um, for the earthquake. And the instrument flew um, uh, before this earthquake and flew within a week of the earthquake and um, helped in the response to the earthquake. And this, this um, image to the right here shows um, a comparison of the UAV SAR data that was collected um, a year before, uh, or sorry, in um, uh, May of 2014, so a few months before, and then collected August 29th, um, just shortly after the earthquake. And it shows that actually multiple strands of the fault slipped. Um, and this was something that was um, somewhat unexpected. Usually, you know, uh, we think that, you know, we have an earthquake rupture and it, may, uh, it happens on one part of the fault that we discovered um, through the, the uh, radar observations that multiple strands of the fault had had actually um, slipped. And this is, is very important when you're uh, studying the effects of um, fault slip, because if there's other parts of the fault that have slipped, then you might have more damage that has occurred as a result of the earthquake. And over here to the left, you see some uh, image processing of the uh, radar data that shows this, um, and this is automated image processing that shows these um, other fractures in the radar image. And this was um, the, some CGS folks that were out in the field, um, and this is da um, cracks out in the Napa Airport um, runway, and they've field validated um, the uh, observations of these fractures that were observed in the radar images um, and they are able to um, uh, use these radar images and go out into the field and validate where they saw uh, the fractures um, in these radar images um, out in the field. So 
Um, another way that we are able to use the radar images is satellite um, radar imagery. And uh, these are some results from ARIA, the Advanced Rapid Imaging and Analysis um, Project. Uh, they were able to produce interferograms from uh, satellite assets. Um, uh, this was from ALOS, um, or sorry, from Cosmos SkyMed. Uh, that's the Italian Space Agency's um, data. And they um, produced uh, a map of the co-seismic displacement. And this is the displacement that occurred um, during the earthquake. And um, this shows uh, the displacement, um, the horizontal displacement that occurred um, during the earthquake. This is very um, important to show um, how much uh, damage might have occurred um, during the earthquake. And they were also able to produce um, what's called a damage proxy map. And this technique um, is a prototype algorithm that helps to um, detect um, damage, and this um, in the red pixels um, shows um, where damage might have occurred, and this can be used to um, show where building damage um, has occurred as, as a result of the earthquake. And again, um, folks that are out responding to this earthquake can use these maps to go out um, and uh, prioritize what resources they're using to respond to this earthquake because they have an idea of where the damage has occurred and then they can go out and field validate um, based on where we have predicted the damage has occurred using these satellite assets. Um, another way that we use the uh, satellite information is by using um, data exploration methods and um, there's a project, um, GeoGateway, and this al allows um, users to uh, find uh, NASA geodetic Im imaging data products and use this for analysis of deformation pre and post events. Um, people can uh, access and analyze UAV SAR uh, repeat, repeat pass interferometry. So the repeat pass interferometry is um, using before and after images um, that show the ground deformation. And uh, you can overlay the California faults um, and um, put those over the UAV SAR product, project products. And then what you can do is create um, a, a, a profile across these and extract what, what's called a line of sight across these. And that allows you to see uh, the ground range change and uh, see what um, deformation is occurring across these faults. And it gives you an idea of um, how much uh, ground motion has occurred um, as a result of these earthquakes. And so this kind of gives you uh, the ability to take these images and do some analysis um, in a web interface so that you can um, both um, during and after the earthquake do some scientific analysis of the data. So I'm going to uh, switch gears now and talk a little bit about um, how we've uh, used uh, remote sensing data to study another earthquake. This was the devastating magnitude 7.8 Gorka Nepal earthquake. Uh, this occurred on April 25th, uh, 2015. And then they had another very large aftershock on May 12th. Um, eight million people were affected by this earthquake. There was um, eight, uh, at least 8,700 8, deaths. Um, including about 150 on the May, uh, May 12th aftershock. Um, about 22,000 people were injured. Um, they, they estimate that 505,000 home plus homes were destroyed. Uh, 279,000 homes were damaged. And an estimated 40% of Nepal was affected by this earthquake. Um, in the wake of this uh, earthquake, NASA and um, various partners developed products using optical radar satellites um, to support the analysis um, uh, efforts. And here is a screen capture of a um, website where um, the various uh, NASA partners um, uh, staged the various products that we developed for the response to this earthquake. And here's the URL for that. So um, again, ARIA, um, the Advanced uh, Rapid Imaging and Analysis Program, um, developed a number of um, uh, SAR-based or synthetic aperture radar-based uh, products for this. 
they analyzed um, the interferometric SAR images from the Sentinel-1 program, and they developed this um, false color map showing the permanent surface motion from this earthquake. And uh, again, they pr produced this damage proxy map from the X-band SAR data from Cosmos SkyMed. And this um, shows the damage um, from the earthquake, um, the color uh, range again uh, for this one. Um, uh, the yellow to red indicates the significant ground change and damage that occurred. Um, and this was field verified by um, NGA, who was out in the field. And so um, you can see here that the red and yellow is the damage that's predicted by the DPM, and um, if you zoom in on this image, there are some purple dots um, where NGA was out or um, out in the field, and they were able to um, verify areas where the uh, damage proxy map had predicted areas where there were landslides and other damage. Um, so another um, team that had uh, produced some images from uh, uh, remote sensing assets was the SPORT team. This is the short-term prediction research and transition team. Uh, and they used a satellite asset called VIRS. And they produced an image showing a decrease in em emitted light. Uh, they used, were, uh, compared pre and post earthquake imagery. Um, the warm colors indicate largest reduced light emissions. Um, and the purple indicates where clouds were. So they're masking out uh, where the clouds were. And this can help the relief operations determine areas that were affected by electrical outages. So um, the comparison of the day-night um, imagery here um, shows where there um, was less emitted light. And when you have less emitted light, you might be um, have areas that are affected by power outages. And this might help to prioritize where um, they want to look at um, areas that um, might have been damaged uh, because they have electrical outages. Um, here is uh, Landsat 8 images of earthquake-induced ground failure. Um, this, is, this is helpful in analyzing where you might have landslides. Um, the images were first obtained on April 30th um, and acquired, uh, this was acquired uh, a mostly cloud-free image of the Long Tong Valley where there was a lot of um, landslide damage. Um, scientists analyzed the imagery and compared it with the pre-earthquake imagery, and they found that part of a village in this area was completely buried. Um, the eastern part appears to have been um, destroyed by a pressure wave um, avalanche uh, that was um, related to um, the earthquake um, inducing this landslide. And uh, large landslides or other avalanches affected other uh, villages. Um, and the uh, extent of damage um, requires further investigation using higher resolution imagery. But using um, even the Landsat, Landsat 8 imagery would, um, was helpful in um, determining where there might have been um, extreme damage that was um, the result of these landslides um, that were induced by the earthquake. OK, so I'm going to now talk about remote sensing observations that were used for monitoring uh, tsunamis. Um, I'm going to talk about the magnitude 9 Northeast Japan earthquake and tsunami. Uh, this earthquake uh, occurred on March 11th of 2011. Uh, this was the largest earthquake in Japan's modern history and the fourth largest recorded in the world. Um, some facts from the Japan Meteorological Agency and NOAA. Um, there were recorded max tsunami heights of um, up to 38.9 meters. Um, and the max, maximum inundation distance of 7.9 7 .9 kilometers inland. Um, reported over 15,000 deaths and 6,000 plus injuries uh, and over 228,000 displaced um, people. Um, there were 127,000 building, buildings collapsed and over 272,000 half collapsed and over 747,000 partially damaged buildings. And over here on the right, we have um, the NASA Earth Observatory data showing um, the, some of the um, information from this uh, tsunami. So um, uh, this is my project, eDecider. 
um, the Emergency Data Enhanced Cyber Infrastructure um, for Disaster Evaluation um, and Response. And this provides decision support for disaster management and response. And for this earthquake, um, we were uh, part of the International Charter um, invocation to provide data to the Japanese government. They were so overwhelmed that they were not able to, to actually do the data analysis themselves. They were too busy responding to the earthquake, so they made a call out to the international community to help them um, do data analysis of the remote sensing data and provide um, the information to uh, them to do an uh, uh, anal uh, analysis and, and then uh, help them do their response. Um, this is a map that we did using MODIS information to um, uh, look at uh, tsunami inundation extent, and the red pixels here show um, the tsunami inundation uh, extent using the MODIS data. So this was uh, 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 the four uh, scene acquired in February, and then um, an after scene acquired on, on March 13th, and we did uh, uh, just a change um, algorithm to, to difference them, and this, this is the red pixels to show um, what we calculated as possible inundation extent. Um, just using before and after um, uh, scenes using um, digital globe information, um, the International Charter um, provided high res access to high resolution commercial satellite imagery um, in response to this earthquake, and we provided this map. Um, showing the inundation extent um, in one of the prefectures that was affected by the earthquake. Um, the scene on the left shows uh, a scene that was uh, acquired uh, a year or so prior to the earthquake, and this scene was uh, acquired um, a day or two after the earthquake. And you can see here um, on the on on the right um, the the extent of the inundation in the dark gray. This is about three uh, kilometers or so um, inland. And um, if you download the, the, um, the slides and look very carefully, you can actually see uh, buildings and bridges that were damaged. You, um, the resolution of this, the imagery is, is so high that you can actually see the, the damage to the, to the buildings. So. Um, NASA assets that were used to show the, the effects. This is ASTER. This is the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer. Um, it, it obtains high resolution um, imaging in 14 different wavelengths. Um, this is showing areas that were covered by vegetation um, in red. So um, this is a before image showing um, an area um, uh, in Japan. Um, in the coastal areas, uh, the cities of Ofunato, Ofunato and Kesunuama. Um, and the, the prior image shows that there's, there's um, quite a lot of vegetation. Um, but uh, the after uh, image, um, cities in unvegetated um, areas are shown in blue-gray. And you can see that in the after image, there are quite a lot of areas that are no longer vegetated because they have been affected by the tsunami. So we can use the um, remote sensing imagery to show um, how the areas um, have been affected by the tsunami. So um, we can also use um, MISER um, to show how um, the tsunami has affected um, uh, the areas uh, um, in Japan. So. Um, uh, MISER is the multi-angle imaging spectrometer. It views Earth simultaneously at nine widely spaced angles and provides ongoing global coverage with accurate measurements of brightness, contrast, and color reflected sunlight. Um, and so it also provides stereoscopic um, images. And um, during the earthquake, it um, provided images that identified um, areas that were um, on fire. Um, from oil refinery fires. So this um, miser image um, on the left um, shows a large smoke plume um, that uh, appears to be associated um, either with um, the, the oil refinery um, fire or Sendai port fires. And then the image to the right is a anaglyph or stere stereoscopic image um, that shows the plume as a 3D uh, feature. 
Um, we can also use um, GPS or the global uh, positioning system to model tsunami wave heights. And this is a project um, of one of the scientists here at JPL, um, Tony Song. Um, he uses the um, GNSS or global navigation system satellites to um, estimate tsunami uh, potential. Um, this can be used to detect the severity and detect or severity direction, severity and direction after an earthquake, and the tsunami um, estimate the tsunami wave heights uh, within minutes. Um, he's used this method to on um, three historic earthquakes to predict the resulting tsunamis, and he's um, using this method. Um, along with NOAA um, as part of um, developing a tsunami early warning system. So the figure on the right uses the three historic earthquakes to predict the resulting um, tsunamis. And there's some pink arrows here that um, show the, the resulting um, GPS uh, displacement. But the colors show um, the tsunami wave heights. And um, if he uh, is able to get the rapid GPS um, results, he can model this and within minutes um, do a prediction of the tsunami wave heights. Um, and this can be used to um, do rapid um, tsunami warnings. So in conclusion, um, for monitoring earthquakes and tsunamis, um, these pose um, substantial risk globally. And we can use the remote sensing techniques to effectively uh, assess the effects of these. Um, a number of NASA and other remote sensing platforms, including UAV SAR um, and satellite INSAR, MODIS, ASTER, MISER, Landsat, Landsat Sport, and GPS, and commercial optical imagery can be used to assess and monitor these effects um, for the disaster. And the International Charter um, can be invoked to um, target these spaceborne assets for response.